Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zhuzhan Naveg. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States in the Engaging Central Europe program. Uh, we will slowly start uh, discussing the outcome of uh, this weekend's elections in Slovakia. Uh, I will just wait for a moment until we reach uh, critical mass with uh, our participants joining. Uh, in the meantime, I would just note that we are recording this event and we will make it available via our uh, social media channels and YouTube. Uh, today's discussion is organized by the Engaging Central Europe program uh, of GMF uh, under the umbrella of the Altlib project. Altlib is an EU-funded Horizon project that is run by um, our partners at the Central European University. And in this project, we are studying the challenges to liberal democracy across Europe. And we are also trying to identify what would be certain entry points for supporting liberal democracy across the continent. Uh, in the framework of this project, uh, we closely follow uh, political developments across um, the entire uh, Europe. And uh, we, of course, pay uh, particular attention to our region, Central Europe. Um, I think slowly we are reaching uh, the critical mass. So once again, I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, on both sides of uh, the Atlantic. And I would also like uh, to welcome our speakers, Zuzana Keplova, Roman Tlatki, and Pavel Damesh. Uh, so today we are discussing um, the Slovak elections that took place on September 30. Uh, the elections um, were not part of the regular programming of Slovak politics. They were early elections brought about the fall of uh, the government at the end of last year in December. Um, as a result, uh, Slovakia has undergone quite a tumultuous year uh, with new parties emerging, populism rising, and essentially having uh, a very uh, event turbulent electoral campaign as well, leading, I would say, also a level of polarization uh, in Slovak politics. So today we have with us three excellent speakers who will help us um, to make sense uh, of what really happened in Slovakia over the past few years that culminated in these early elections. Uh, Zuzana will also uh, give a little bit of overview about that. Um, Roman will help us understand uh, the election results and uh, give us an overview about um, what's in store uh, for uh, the coming weeks, how coalition formation may happen. And Pa will also touch on uh, the implications um, of these elections on the country's foreign policy, its uh, international standing. Just to um, set the scene, so we know that the uh, Slovak elections were won by uh, Smer, uh, former Prime Minister Fico, already was entrusted uh, with the task of forming government uh, two days ago by President Chaputova. But it's not a straightforward game. Uh, there are multiple coalition options. Um, former Prime Minister Fico made it clear that his preferred option would be a cooperation between Smer class and SNS, so uh, the radical right uh, party and um, a social democratic uh, spin-off of, um, of SMER. So the question is whether that can really uh, come about or we may see progressive Slovakia in some form um, entering the scene. Um, Zuzana, I would start with you. You are a journalist columnist at SME. Uh, you have closely followed the developments over um, the past weeks and also years. Um, what was this uh, election really about? 
uh, how did the electoral landscape um, transformed over the past years and, and what were the key topics that you would highlight? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zuzia, for, for having me. Um, I work for SMA, which is um, now after the elections week, uh, a number one uh, outlet in uh, Slovak internet. And we are very proud for that. Uh, I would I would say, I would, I would kick off the topic saying that the best thing about this campaign is that it is over, finally. We are relieved, we are, we are quite happy for that. So whatever comes afterwards, um will will be better than than the stress that we had before um i will give you a little bit of the background on the on the previous three years that led us to um robert fitzo returning to the scene with a uh, an impressive result i have to say 23 percent um and i will i will lead you a little bit through the the uh, tumultuous time that that we had during these three years um, the election campaign took a little bit more, a little bit, little bit longer than than usually, because the government of Prime Minister Heger started having serious problems uh, before last summer, and that was when uh, one of the coalition members decided they that they uh, might want to leave the coalition, and they eventually left it in September. And uh, the minority government fell down, down uh, mid-December. And now you can count with me, uh, mid-December last year, that was the moment when, when uh, Heger's government fell down. And we only have elections end of September this year. So this past weekend, I, this, is an, uh, this is quite unusual, I would say, if, if we compare with other countries. And uh, we might ask why why that happened, and uh, I would I would uh, I would say that it really uh, stimulated the conspiracies that were used by the opposition that uh, the that the uh, the elections might never take place, uh, that if they take place they might be fraudulent, or uh, that the actual point of having uh, having elections end of September in in the nine months. Uh, the point is to to keep sending arms to to Ukraine. Uh, why I'm send, uh, saying this uh, is because uh, uh, one of the main claims of the oppositions was uh, not to send a single ballot uh, to to Ukraine. So stop helping Ukraine. So this this topic was quite important for for the opposition, and uh, uh, the coalition gave them uh, a good ammunition with uh, setting the elections that that late. Uh, since May two thousand twenty three, so May this year, we we had the caretaker government, which was appointed by the president Saputova, and as soon as this government lost confidence the actual campaign started. So we are actually in campaign since May. Um, I, have to, I have to say that Robert Fitzo, the, the, the leader of the nominal social uh, democracy, he has been really in campaign from the moment he lost power, from the moment Smer was... Uh, 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 lost the elections in 2020. Of course, he had a very strong personal motivation to do so because the government of Igor Matovich, uh, that's, the, that's the winner of 2020 elections, he was promising to clean the state from corruption and organized crime, which in other words uh, meant investigations concerning the opposition figures and their enablers, which made Robert Fico and Smer quite nervous. And uh, they, they really were motivated to, to campaign very hard. Uh, I will just quickly remind you uh, the situation in which uh, Robert Fitzo lost power because it gives you a little bit of, of an impression why he was so motivated. Uh, in 2018, he had to step down uh, after the prolonged period of uh, demonstrations following the murder of investigative journalist Jan Kusiak and his partner. And instead of having snap elections, uh, the coalition decided uh, that they just want to reconstruct the government and named Peter Pellegrini the prime minister. 
Now, uh, Peter Pellegrini is an important figure in this process because after the elections uh, in 2020, he decided to leave Smer and form another social democratic party. And he took uh, some of the um, uh, some of the established party figures with him. Now, this uh, this competition of two social dem democratic parties might give you an idea why Smer had to radicalize so much, and it really shaped the campaign. So Peter Pellegrini decided to to run a, a, a more moderate social democracy, pro European. Um, Partially pro-Ukrainian as, as well, but then Smer uh, decided to 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 be very different. They they learned quite a lot from the from the pro Kremlin uh, uh, scene from the from the far right. So they were using all kind of tricks and and really really radicalized uh, in a in a grave manner. And the result was that in the in the final battle between social democracy and the progressives, uh, the electorate of uh, uh, the Party Republica, which is a proper fascist party, decided to support Smer in the battle so that the progressives won't won't uh, win the elections. Uh, I think this this uh, might illustrate quite well that Fito worked a lot in order to. To be acceptable for the for for the uh, ultra nationalist nationalist even fascist electorate, and uh, probably if you ask him, he would say that thanks to him, there is not a proper fascist party in the parliament. Republika dropped out. Uh, the Slovak National Party is in, but not with an impressive result. And uh, Smer might, is now uh, going to form a government, and we we might talk about it uh, a bit later. And uh, if I if I can sum up with just a brief, um, just just to to name some of the factors that I think shaped the elections. Uh, and number one, I think, is the instability of the governments. Uh, after 2020 elections, I really think that that, that really made an impact that Mr. Fico could come with uh, saying that he will bring the stability and, and the order back to the country. Uh, number two would be the impact of the inflation. And num number three are the actual election topics. So this is this is my uh, hierarchy that, that I would present. And uh, I'm looking forward to reacting to, to, to your questions and, and maybe to my um, following speakers. Thank you very much, Susanna, for uh, setting the scene. Um, indeed, the radicalization of SMER has been fairly prevalent, already ongoing, I would argue, um, not just in this uh, past few years, but um, ever since it first cooperated with uh, SNS, there has been a massive shift, and this also influences the entirety of uh, the Slovak uh, party spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. But with that, I will move to Roman and ask you about uh, your assessment of uh, the coalition options. Zguzana also suggested that we may see uh, Smer returning. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that it's essentially a done deal or uh, could we still expect surprises? And uh, you have just recently written a short piece for us uh, in which you were arguing that the return of Smer to power would actually bring about uh, significant domestic challenges, um, which are, I would again link back to what Susanna was arguing uh, about smear courting the electorate of uh, the far right. It would really actually bring the far right's uh, agenda much more uh, to the mainstream. So I'm wondering how you see the chances for that now in light of uh, the worst results of uh, these parties than we were expecting uh, based on um, public opinion polls. Sure. 
Uh, thank you, Zuzana, for having us here today um, and organizing this panel. I think the the very first question you uh, told me to to actually discuss right when we spoke over email is whether this election result is surprising, right? Um, so I just want to start there. And I think most observers would say, no, they are not surprised, right? Pretty much every pre-election poll told us that it's going to be a very tight battle, right, between the top two. But in every pre-election poll we saw, yeah, finish first, right, ahead of progressive Slovakia. But um, their overall result of, I think, 23%, as Zuzana was saying, was a little bit surprising, right, that they managed that much. And they managed to do that exactly by what we've just been talking about, right, siphoning voters away from Republika, right, who didn't make it into parliament, from SNS, who almost didn't make it into parliament. So we really are seeing a radicalized, yeah, at least in the campaign, right? Whether that radicalization uh, continues in office, I think is a different question and really does depend on coalition formation, which we'll talk about. Um, one other, or a couple of other things I wanna stress about the election results, right? Is that we should be optimistic, right? And we should be motivated by the result of progressive Slovakia. 18% is a great result for them, right? Especially when we compare it to 2020, right? Which was catastrophic. Campaigning as a progressive, liberal, pro-European party um, in Slovakia is difficult, right? And Michal Šimečka, the leader of progressive Slovakia, ran a great campaign, right? He really put himself forward as a leader who was kind of above the, uh, I guess, more aggressive political campaigning styles, right? He focused on the issues, tried to convince voters uh, about a very positive vision of Slovakia's future, right? So by no means was progressive uh, Slovakia's result disappointing um, as, you know, an absolute number, um, though, of course, they wish they, they would have finished first. Um, one thing I would like to stress about that S is, is that it still has a lot to do, a lot of work to do in convincing voters in the regions, right? That S remains a party of the urban kind of elite, right? Talking about Bratislava, talking about Košice, um, especially in Eastern Slovakia, right? The numbers there are pretty bad for, for that S. Um, and so this is something that they should really focus on in the future, right, is appealing to voters outside of the city. Um, again, it's tough for them, right, because their policy position, their vision uh, stands at odds with the opinions of those voters, but they really do have to make some inroads there. Um, the fact that Republika did not make it into parliament is extremely important, right, because the worst case scenario for Slovakia would have been a government of Republika, Smier and SNS. Um, it wouldn't have been Fico's first choice of government, but Fico's primary goal is to come back to power, stop corruption proceedings, take away the special prosecutor, replace the police president, right? And the Republica and SNS would have been willing partners to get him there. So it's definitely a coalition that would have formed. So we avoided a, a worst case scenario with the election, which is a good thing, I think. And in terms of results, the fact that KDH, the Christian Democratic Party, made it to parliament is also uh, important to consider because they may or may not be consequential for uh, coalition formation, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, and so, uh, spoiler alert, right, if we want to kind of summarize my take on how I think coalitions will form, I think the likeliest outcome is we will see a coalition of Smyr, Hlas, and the Slovak National Party, right, SNS, the radical right. Um, and to understand the, the kind of bargaining and the dynamics that are going on here, um, it's really important to focus on KDH and Hlas, because they are the key to any coalition that's going to form. Um, if the coalition ends up forming, right, no matter what form it takes, Hlas has to be in it. They have two choices. They can go with Smyr or they can turn Smyr down and go with the second place progressive Slovakia. Starting with the less likely, though not impossible latter option, right, Hlas going with uh, progressive Slovakia. Hlas is going to be a very, very, very expensive partner for progressive Slovakia, right, because they play the role of pivotal party. They are ne a necessary condition for any coalition to form. If they decide to go with progressive Slovakia, they're going to demand the premiership, right, the position of prime minister and several strong ministries. 
And I think that progressive Slovakia would be willing to give it to them, right? Progressive Slovakia, ever since the election result came out, said their number one goal is to stop Fico from coming to power, right? Plus is the clear avenue. A partnership with Plus is the clear avenue for doing so. Um, so I think that they are willing to make those sacrifices. This coalition would be filled out by the Christian Democrats and SIS, right? And so what you would have is a social democratic party in Hlas, a socio-cultural liberal kind of centrist party in progressive Slovakia, and two right-leaning parties, one socio-culturally liberal, that being SIS, and the other very socially culturally conservative, right, being Kadeha. And uh, in the words of Petr Pellegrini, who after the election commented on this, it's a mishmash, right? It's a very ideologically diverse coalition, varying viewpoints, and it would be messy, right? Uh, it's not saying that government uh, would be easy because the only goal uniting that coalition, all four parties, right, is to stop Fico from coming to power. Importantly, um, there's strong opposition within Hlas. <laughs> to joining the liberal progressive Slovakia, right? If Pellegrini makes that decision, it could have costly ramifications within the party with some of his party members defecting to Smyr. Now, the decision-making of Kadeha also is makes that coalition unlikely to happen because PS, progressive Slovakia, would have to give up many of its, many aspects of its um, progressive agenda, right? Kadeha will make, its participation in a coalition conditional on the S basically removing a large chunk of its program from any policy that the coalition will form, right? Talking namely here about registered partnerships, right? We're not even talking about same-sex marriage in the Slovak context yet, right? We're talking about registered partnerships. Um, and this is a very sticky point, uh, which means that Kadeha um, would which makes Kadeha unlikely to, to join that coalition. Now, the likeliest option, I think, is that Hlas joins with Smyr. This appears to be the stronger consensus within Hlas, right? Though I don't think it's personally Petr Pellegrini's preferred option, right? We can debate that. Him and Fico don't get along with one another, but there's still strong elements within the Hlas leadership of the party itself that favor the coalition with Smyr. Again, they're going to ask for the premiership as the pivotal party. I think Fico is less likely to give it to them than progressive Slovakia would be. So here we would expect Pellegrini as speaker of the parliament, potentially. And the interesting part about this coalition is that I expect we see Hlas take the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? Um, and I think in this coalition, we see Hlas play a moderating role, right? Uh, and it gives Fico some cover, right? He puts uh, maybe, you know, uh, Petr Kmetz, who's the former Slovak ambassador to the United States in the role of foreign minister. Um, and he says, look, you know, I'm not that bad of a guy, right? And Fico, uh, and then Klaus gets to form some of the key foreign policy decisions deflecting some of the international scrutiny that Fico has been facing away from, from Smyr. Now, Klaus in this dynamic does not want this coalition to form with SNS because SNS is a clear ally of Smyr. They would prefer this coalition with Kadeha, so meaning Smyr, Hlas, and Kadeha. Um, having Kadeha in that coalition gives Hlas a partner with which to limit Smyr and limit the power of Fico, right? SNS, on the other hand, is going to be a willing ally to whatever Smyr wants to do in that coalition, and they will side with Smyr against any of the policy decisions that Hlas wants to advance, right? Um, SNS itself, right, is a fairly unstable uh, party within parliament, right? The only member of the ticket, which was elected to parliament on SNS, that is actually a member of the SNS party, is Andrei Danko, the party leader. Uh, he was successful or relatively successful in achieving office by... Uh, organizing a whole bunch of smaller radical right nationalists, very pro-Christian parties, but these are not members of SNS as a party, right? So there are some concerns that dynamics within that group will be, will be unstable. And so then the final question that that leaves us is, is will Kadeha join with Hlas and Smyr, right? SNS definitely would. Would Kadeha, the Christian Democrats, do it? All signals, both post- and pre-election suggests that this is not something they want to do or will do, right? 
uh, Milan Mayevsky, uh, the, the chairman of Kadeha, has come out against it. Several other prominent members of Kadeha have come out against a coalition with Smer. Uh, Kadeha does hold its uh, national conference, right, with the wider regional party structures in less than two weeks, where a decision, a formal decision will be made. This isn't enough time since President Chaputova gave Fico two weeks to form a coalition, right? So things are moving quickly. Um, there have been some rumblings from party membership that they may potentially want to join Smyr. And there is, as I mentioned earlier, right, a strong opposition towards the liberal agenda of progressive Slovakia within Kadeha. So most likely scenario is Kadeha will sit in opposition, not forced to take either bad decision for their membership and for their leadership structure, right? They don't have to side with the evil, right? According to them, that is Robert Fico. They don't have to advance the progressive agenda in a coalition with progressive Slovakia. So to put a bow on all of this, right? I think the likeliest outcome that we see is a coalition with Smyr, Hlas, and the Slovak National Party. Um, though everyone will work to avoid this, right? It does not mean that early elections aren't outside the realm of possibility, right? There is always the threat that these parties don't agree with one another. Uh, no coalition is formed, right? And we do this all over again um, in probably the worst case scenario because it would aid Fitzel to have early elections, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin, for uh, this broad overview and uh, your assessment. So definitely the uh, two weeks uh, ahead of us are still going to be uh, very exciting and then we'll see uh, what follows um, now during the electoral campaign uh, some aspects of foreign policy have also uh, entered the discussions um, and one of the campaign topics became uh, Slovakia's support towards Ukraine uh, arising pro-Russian rhetoric narrative from uh, uh, Robert Fico. Pavel, uh, you are um, a visiting distinguished fellow at GMF and have been um, working on various aspects of Slovak politics uh, over uh, the years. I would like to ask your assessment about uh, what this campaign really means about or it means for Slovak foreign policy and whether um, these discussions that have emerged uh, would really translate into policy, in your opinion, if uh, Smer uh, is indeed successful in forming a government. Okay, thank you, Zuzana. Uh, for, for this, I am happy to be uh, partnering with Zuzana and Roman on this panel. And I'm glad that Slovakia is on the map and of interest because uh, after many, many years, I got many phone calls from various international media trying to figure out what's going on with this country, whether this will be second Hungary, whether Robert Fico, uh, and I try to uh, teach many of them that it's not Fico, but Fico, because many people forgot about this politician, uh, whether Robert Fico will be second Viktor Orban, who may undermine unity of European Union, unity of transatlantic community, NATO, whether he will act similarly vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, refusing or criticizing sanctions of EU and also threatening to stop military aid uh, to Ukraine, for which Slovakia was uh, so known throughout one and a half years because Slovakia was among first countries which started to help with significant military assistance parallel to humanitarian, economic, political, and so on. Uh, so let me add a few things on pre-election debate and foreign policy component in it. And then I will tell you a few things how I see now post-election situation vis-a-vis our foreign policy orientation. I would say that uh, since I am more, th more than three decades engaged one way or another in Slovak foreign policy, also being member of government or advising first head of state and then 
commenting on what went on as analysts, uh, I can tell you that foreign policy was so prominent in pre-election campaign like never before. Every, I mean, topics uh, related to foreign policy became of uh, enormous importance and prominence throughout whole debates uh, in electronic media uh, and social media and so on and so forth. And it is not only related to war and consequences of war or at shaping attitudes of people vis-a-vis -vis war uh, or debate how to end this war, naming who is in charge, why, and so on and so forth. But also this election campaign had very strong component, uh, the sort of cultural value politics where the West was accused very often of pushing through LGBT agenda and all kinds of other agendas, which according critics were against traditional values of Slovak. So parallel to war, this was this cultural ethical element, which was associated with that. United States was used by Robert Fico very effectively. He was shooting at US the way we never seen before. It started during last year debate on uh, this defense treaty uh, between Slovakia and US when Robert Fico came out with this idea that this is going to be like colonizing Slovakia by Americans remembering 1968 where Soviet troops came because as Eastern flank NATO country member, we have on our territory foreign troops, uh, which started to come right after, uh, right after invasion February last year. Uh, so Robert Fitzo and his very conscious attempt to uh, label America and making US responsible also for war in Ukraine, he was working on that very systematically. He said basically his narrative was that this is not war between two Slavic nations, but this is war between United States and uh, Russia on territory of Ukraine, uh, which this ridiculous topic was sort of repeated, repeated, repeated. And in our country with rather pacifist population and with more favorable pro-Russian sentiment than in any other neighboring countries, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, if you look at all sociological data suggested that Slovaks are willing to look at Russian way of judging what's going on rather than American, and Fico was very skillfully misusing it because this was narrative of ultra-rights and nationalists that we Slavs need to work together and we need to stop these Western spread of Western values of all kinds. And we cannot give up on, uh, on forgetting Russia's role or Soviet Union's role in uh, liberating World War II, but even going deeper. So we learned a great deal about our attitudes towards Russia. But parallel to that, one have to see that government was clear cut. I mean, President was accused by Robert Fitzgerald, the chief agent of US embassy and of George Soros. Uh, everybody, including current caretaker government, Prime Minister uh, Odor was labeled that he Soros is because he gave some lecture at CEU in Vienna and so on. So this ridiculous accusation of US, both government and George Soros, uh, who is equally strong as US government, according to these people, sort of paid off and we didn't believe that this type of uh, uh, approach would be so beneficial for Robert Fitzgerald. But President, Prime Minister, Speaker of the Parliament and all leading uh, political groups had clear-cut pro-Ukrainian, clear-cut pro-EU, pro-NATO attitudes, no doubt. But because of these ridiculous steps by Fitzgerald and some of his uh, sort of ultra-right uh, fellows, uh, it created this mishmash in pre-election time. I want to remind you and remind us that last year we expelled 33 Russian diplomats from Bratislava, and a couple of days ago another Russian diplomats had to pack suitcases and go home because they were interfering into our pre-election uh, uh, times, and uh, so 
unheard of that 34 Russian diplomats expelled from small country. So these, these needs to be said. Also a street where Russian embassy is located was renamed Boris Nemtsov Street last year where widow and daughter of Boris Nemtsov attended that ceremony, which was uh, done similarly as our friends in Prague did, uh, and so on. So you have these big tension, pro-Russian, pro-American, and so on. So it was part of debate, not only war in Ukraine, but also the civilizational belonging, whether we belong to the Western civilization or we are somewhere in between, and we need to have four vector foreign policy uh, dealing with everybody because these would be better for us. Uh, then if you could look also at uh, uh, this campaign, this was interesting from the point that there were five former prime ministers running in this campaign, which is rather uh, anomaly but we had Zurinda, Fico, Pellegrini, Matovic, and Heger. And three out of five made it to parliament or their subjects, uh, Fico, Pellegrini, and Matovic. And Matovic is like hooligan of Slovak politics with whom three years ago what Zuzana was mentioning, and I agree that people had this belief that new government with constitutional majority could clean all kinds of corruption things and so on. Robert Fitzo three years ago was nobody thought that he may reemerge and be active and player, but because of Matovic and his eccentric personality and uh, quarrels and collapse. In last three years, we had three foreign ministers. It just tells you what kind of uh, term turbulence we had domestically and also so within three years, three foreign ministers uh, it just shows, but all three from the position vis-a-vis -vis Russia or vis-a-vis -vis our membership, uh, EU, NATO commitment and so on, they were clear cut together with defense ministers. Last comment which I want to make is who congratulated newly new winner, it's indicative, and also who already made some st uh, stress or conditionality for newly uh, new winner. Only Viktor Orban, buddy of Robert Fico, congratulated him. Uh, Czechs who are traditional, tra Czechs are far close as partner. I mean, there was rather a surprise that this happened because after exit poll, people thought that, uh, that, uh, that progressive Slovakia won. When we woke up, we saw that uh, those pollsters did some mistake or what something deadly wrong happened because about 5% difference occurred. But when we went to bed, progressive were winning 1.5 roughly in exit polls. So I think that Czech uh, political leaders, because they were also accused by Fico uh, 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 during campaign, so there was not much congratulation. Andrei Babish congratulated former prime minister who is mentally similar like Robert Fico, uh, but not sort of uh, people ra were rather surprised uh, that he made it to the top. And uh, European socialist did something very unusual because uh, head of European socialist group, uh, Stefan L L Lofven made very clear comment that if Smer party, Smer hyphen Slovak Social Democratic Party, if they will continue having rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine like what they have, that they are risking to be expelled from European socialists. And Hlas party, which is applicant to European socialists, will have to now look very carefully how are they handling themselves because there may be danger if they would create this coalition government with Slovak National Party, if they would behave like they behave. I mean, uh, Smer Party and Robert Fico, even if he after election said that there will not be change in Slovak foreign policy, that we are a member of the EU, Peter Pellegrini made it as very strong statement that for him, he will never enter government, which wouldn't clearly put into government manifesto pro-EU, pro-NATO. Uh, 
even he started to downplay about selling arms for Ukraine because ah, if they are produced here, we, this is market, we produce cars, we produce also this military equipment. We will see because workers are working on this and so on. So I think that European socialists will have tough challenge now looking at these two subjects because we have two social democracies, one member with that particular behavior and Peter Pellegrini, who is applicant uh, to that. And in conclusion, I will make just one provocative uh, concluding statement. I don't think that Slovakia, that Robert Fico deserves to be prime minister. And I don't think that Slovakia deserves to have Robert Fico as prime minister. And I still think that there is chance that my statement may come true because this will be very complicated debate now about coalition formation. Many things what, uh, what Roman was saying, the likelihood of this coalition of three, because we have seven political parties who made it to parliament, but that this one, uh, Smer, Hlas and Slovak National Party may be three coalition members with about 79 votes out of 150. But I wouldn't rule out that we will have no Fico, but our future prime minister will be Peter Pellegrini. I'm finishing with this. Thank you very much, Pavel, for uh, also giving us a glimpse of maybe ahead when it comes to uh, policy implications. Um, I would like to encourage our uh, audience to uh, raise questions, you can either put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, but before uh, moving on to your questions, I would like to ask our speakers if they would like to uh, react to each other uh, on any point. I would like to react on, on what Pavel suggested. Um, I strongly believe that there is actually a battle for the soul of social democracy, which is going on. And it it um, it does not contain only Slovakia. Here, there is Mr. Fico Smer, which went full uh, national socialism, I would say. And then there is Hlas, which which tries to, let's say, conserve the 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 actual uh, faults of social democracy. And um, I think the signal that came from from the um, European Socialist uh, Group is quite fortunate. They they already did it several times. And uh, I think this is this is an interesting impulse for them to to react and to maybe um, get rid of Smer and replace it with Hlas and set limits for the campaign. Because what Mr. Fico is doing is that he's really uh, using whatever tools are necessary for him to to win the elections, and he's very good at it. He's he's a, a very apt ma marketer and and. Uh, a seasoned politician, and he's able to win. But at the same time, I think we should have some limits. If you want to call a, a party social dem democracy, then you cannot really uh, have a Nazi influencer in the campaign and uh, uh, stand uh, on, on one podium with uh, the leader of Repu uh, Republica, which is a proper fascist party so i think set, really setting limits to to campaigns uh, would be a good gesture thank you very much susanna anybody else just to maybe uh provide a little bit of historic context on this specific point right this isn't the first time that this has happened between the party of european socialists and, and robert Fizzo, right this is a a reoccurring dynamic um yeah. and normatively important right clear stake um about what you know european social democracy should look like uh more relevant question is whether this has repercussions for fizzo right um whether he cares whether uh, this is going to limit his behavior in any way and i think that we are going to see in general across both foreign and domestic policy right a more 
I'm not saying a not dangerous pizza, right? Pizza is dangerous, but we are going to see at least, especially when it comes to foreign policy, right? A more moderate um, Robert Fizzo in government that as opposed to the radical Robert Fizzo that we saw in the, on the campaign trail. Yeah, I think that if I may add to this, uh, while I was arguing and I'm um, arguing that Robert Fizzo, uh, mixing Robert Fizzo or making parallelism between Robert Fizzo and Viktor Orban is wrong. Uh, Viktor Orban is winning big style, has majority, and can, uh, he can dictate what politics should be done. Robert Fizzo, as we see with his 23%, he won, but this is not such a big margin. And secondly, everybody who is now going to talk to him in government formation will be putting very tough condition on him. Uh, so this is not that he is in full control of both political landscape, but also public. Moreover, you know, I think that if Peter Pellegrini would push him that, okay, I uh, I may go, but I want to be prime minister, it is not an easy uh, psychological situation. Can you imagine that somebody would uh, tell from Hungarian political landscape, Viktor Orban, that Viktor, it's fine, you want, but you will not be prime minister, unimaginable. But Robert Fico may end up being in this type of position. Yeah. Also, if you look at 150 members of the parliament, you know, these are people, uh, vast majority of them are pro-EU, uh, I mean, democratic, regular, politically, so it's very strong group of parliamentarians uh, who will also and last but not least independent media and uh, independent NGOs will not disappear because Robert Fizzo said in election campaign that he will uh, create completely new situation for NGOs that he will introduce law like what they have in Russia on foreign that anybody who will receive foreign grant will have to use uh, label foreign agent, that he will deal with media and so on and so forth. Surely he is threatening several groups which he considers that they are they may potentially undermine his rule. But I don't think that it will be so easy. And that is why I think that he will be, and here I agree with what you, Roman, said, that he will start showing different face both vis-a-vis -vis foreign partners and vis-a-vis -vis domestic actors and public, uh, because he would say that, okay, while we are reaching compromise, we need to do this or that. And these European socialists, this is right thing that, okay, if you are as a country member of EU and NATO, there are some conditions which members have to fulfill. If you are member of political family, there are some principles and norms which you need to obey. You are not going to dictate how socialist or how EU or how NATO should behave. Surely, I mean, EU, NATO are consensus uh, driven groupings, but you cannot just simply come and say that, okay, stop doing this or do this or that. You can come and negotiate, but you are not going to dictate like in town hall meeting in central or eastern Slovakia. Thank you very much, Pavel, uh, Roman and Zuzana for uh, your initial insights and also for uh, your reactions to each other. Um, I would first still uh, maybe stick with um, coalition formation and uh, then would move into both domestic and foreign implications. Uh, in the meantime, I'm keeping an eye on the incoming questions, so I'm going to bring those in as well. Uh, but again, uh, I encourage everybody to share their uh, questions and comments with us in the audience. Um, so first, still to the coalition uh, formation question. Uh, we have been talking about the radicalization of uh, SMER. And... Uh, Likely, we would see, uh, that was uh, also Roman's assessment, a coalition between uh, Smer, Las, and SNS, of course, um, we understand that it's still a volatile situation. 
So my question to you uh, first is, um, and bringing in a question from the audience here, um, what kind of SNS are we talking about? Is it still uh, the radical SNS that we have seen? Did the party really moderate? Some observers were arguing that indeed uh, the SNS of today is a more moderate party than it used to be. Or is it simply that now we have more uh, radical, more extremist parties on the right who have entered the scene? First, Kotleba's LSNS. Now we have seen uh, Republika. So what can we really say about the ideological profile of SNS? And that would be one question I would put to you. But also remaining first with the parties, um, throughout our uh, discussion now, we have been talking for roughly 50 minutes. Um, there was one mention of Matovic. Uh, so I would ask you about the role or the lack of it uh, of Olano and what Melaya had for uh, the party. Also, uh, and this applies to all <laughs> political actors on the Slovak scene, that Zuzana in the beginning mentioned that the country has been in campaign mode since May. And yes, now we had the early elections, but next year is also bringing uh, a very important election. In Slovakia, typically the turnout is very low, uh, at the European parliamentary elections, but uh, that may change in light of uh, the election turnout that we have just seen this weekend with uh, 68%, which is really high for the country. So uh, with that ahead, uh, what can we expect uh, from the political parties? Will the campaign continue and how that may influence uh, current coalition negotiations that just as early as middle of next year, next elections are again coming up. Uh, any takers for these questions? I can start briefly with SNS. Um, yeah. And I think that the, the clear answer is that we don't know what type of SNS we are dealing with in this current parliament, right? We know we are dealing with Andrei Danko. Um, he is the only SNS member in parliament, right? His other... Uh, the other individuals who ran on the SNS ticket that made it to parliament, right, were elected on the ticket of LSNS, right, in the previous election, in the 2020 election, some of them were, right, this is talking about Tomasz Daraba, uh, the Kufovci brothers, or son and uh, father, right, and what we're seeing is that, at least my, my estimation would be that these individuals that were elected on the ballot of SNS are more radical than SNS as a party, right? Um, Andrei Danko and the people who were elected on his ticket in these kind of post-election campaign promises, and I think Bubble mentioned this, right? There have been kind of rhetoric about, oh, you know, we respect NATO, we are a part of NATO, we are a part of the European Union, but we have to be a sovereign um, element, right? A sovereign part of, of these uh, international organizations, right? So I think that the behavior of SNS in this upcoming parliament will be unpredictable, will be volatile. And it is true that we are seeing uh, ra radical individuals who were elected on the ticket of SNS in parliament, but are not themselves members of SNS. Thank you, Roman. I would agree with this assessment that uh, this is not standard SNS as we used to know it. And those individuals with their uh, characteristics and uh, performance, uh, what we have seen from them since they joined parliament with this uh, Kotlebas uh, group, I think that suggests that they will not change dramatically but good thing is that they are not so strong. I mean, as far as numbers and uh, moreover, they would like to just benefit out of being in spotlight and, and be there. So they will be very junior partner, but nonetheless, they create headache for everybody to, to bring them in. And as was said at the very beginning, big news uh, is that Republika, party which in last 
year, everybody thought that these were sometimes even number three, number four in public uh, opinion polls, that they got 4.7, something like that, and didn't make it to parliament because uh, they are very well organized and very capable and homogeneous group. Unlike this SNS where Andre Danko is the only one from former SNS and will have to govern or or be in parliament with this group of people who were completely out of that field. And lastly, uh, SNS, you, I mean, traditional SNS used to be in coalition with Robert Fitzo already and together with Hazedes. And Robert Fitzo is very skillful keeping, uh, I mean, controlling oxygen of his political partners, particularly if they are uh, small. So I think that if he would create coalition with them for Peter Pellegrini and others, they are big problem uh, because of their value system and so on. They will try to uh, do something for them. Christian Democrats would be much better uh, to trio, but Christian Democrats already said that they are not going to any government where Smeris. So I one can imagine if they would be there that... Uh, that Fitzo would be able to manage them somehow, not to destroy or undermine uh, his governance, because he will have plenty things to do uh, because of inflation, because of social situation, health, education, and so on. So anybody who is going to govern will have enormous challenges of domestic nature and also challenges dealing with international community uh, so for that reason, my expectation is that uh, they will try whoever will be in any composition to have foreign and defense ministers to be professionals and rather than ideologues uh, to, to play and improvise with that because of multiple challenges. And lastly, Slovakia is member of Eurozone, unlike Hungary. And we are more integrated and intertwined with economy of European Union, having over 80% uh, export to you and so on and so forth. So I think that you cannot just start jumping and, and, and creating trouble in dealing with European Union because of this deep integration of the country, what we have. Mm -hmm. I would have two more points to add to this. Um, a, a coalition which has Smer, Hlas, and uh, the Slovak National Party in it would have 79 MPs, and 70, 76 is uh, the number of, of majorities. So every, every one of these MPs matter. So it's going to be quite volatile, and it really matters who, who these people are and, and how they vote. Uh, I wonder whether Mr. Danko, Andre Danko, knows um, uh, who got on the list because he was uh, he was trying to really join um, all kind of bloggers and and uh, uh, influencers from the from the nationalist and the, even the conspiracy scene. So I, I really wonder whether he's in in control and even knows his uh, candidates. And uh, my second point uh, would be that uh, Tomas Taraba, who got in on the list of uh, Slovak National Party, um, he was already in a position when when uh, he was quite important with uh, the minority supporting the minority government of uh, Eduard Heger, and uh, he knows how to be in control. So there is a slight chance that he might actually be uh, the most important figure in in uh, um, the club of Slovak National Party. I agree. And Thank you. Susanna, we avoided two points in your complex question. Mm -hmm. uh, next uh, next year's elections and the uh, persona of Igor Matovich. So let me uh, share some of my views on that. So Igor, I will start with Igor Matovich and his ordinary people. Last time it was ordinary people and independent personalities. Now he created, he's master of creating sort of pre-election class. Uh, and uh, 
he knows how to use scandals, how to use social media very skillfully. And many people who thought that after his three year governance uh, and how he was able to ruin and undermine government, which he labeled during uh, sworn in that this will be the best Slovak government in history. Well, uh, it didn't happen. And people thought that uh, voters will uh, show it to him that they are displeased with his promise, but nonetheless, he is so skillful. So he created ordinary people and friends. Uh, so he was bringing all kinds of uh, newcomers and created just before election physical fight uh, scandal in front of uh, government together with Robert Fico and all his billboards was that he will stop mafia and that these elections are about people or mafia. So after elections, he declared that, okay, mafia won, but he got uh, very significant support. So he will have a quite strong club in the parliament, but he very openly said upfront that his party will not end up in any uh, any coalition, but even if he would say that he is open, nobody would go with him. So he is labeled that he has zero coalition potential. And basically his role in political ecosystem would be continuation of fight against uh, Robert Fico and Peter Pellegrini and that group uh, and so on, and reminding corruption scandals and all these issues related to prosecution, police, and so on, because these will be big theme. How do government, if Fitz or Las are in power, they already indicated that president of police, special prosecutor, and, and several others will be uh, on target and they would have to leave. So Igor Matovic, I think, will be reminding constantly some of the economic uh, corruptions and, and all these uh, issues related to investigation and so on and so forth. And as far as elections is concerned, next year we have not only European elections, but presidential elections in spring. And since Zuzana Chaputova already announced that due to unbearable uh, situation, which this office is bringing to her brutality, attacks on her personality, on, on, on herself and, and her family, that she's not going to run, Right after government formation, I think Slovaks will be bombed with sort of these presidential elections. And so far, Ivan Korčok, a former quite popular foreign minister, already announced and he has collected signatures which are required to run. So we will see who else will be running because uh, Ivan Korčok was shooted at immediately by during uh, pre-election campaign by Fico and, and several others that this is another Chaputova male version, pro-American, Americans will be behind this and so on. So we will see a pre-election campaign starting right after government formation, and it will show how polarized, how split we are, and what kind of tactics and strategies presidential candidates will use in uh, running for this office. And European elections for us, I mean, mentally are still far away. Uh, Michal Šimečka, who was, uh, he declared that he will stop being member of European Parliament where he is vice president after these elections. So there are some, some moves and most visible is uh, Michal Šimečka who will turn from Europe parliamentarian and there is second Viesik Zuzana I think he mentioned also that he will he was elected to Slovak parliament so he may end or or terminate his position in European parliament and come back to Slovak uh, politics Thank you very much, Pavel, for uh, this in-depth answer and also uh, to Zuzana and Roman uh, for sharing your views on SNS. Um, I would now turn towards some of uh, the questions regarding uh, domestic implications. In part, we have already touched on this, uh, but I would like to uh, expand a little bit into 
uh, the role of the economic situation. Susanna in the beginning mentioned that one of the key issues was inflation um, that was uh, shaping the campaign. Uh, and and Pavola also mentioned that uh, whoever forms a governing coalition will have to face serious domestic challenges. Of course, we know that uh, Slovakia is a member of the Eurozone, so that gives it a, a special context. So I would like to ask you about uh, economic uh, implications of these elections. Um, also in the context of um, the fight against corruption uh, that may or may not be hit by which parties manage to um, formulate uh, a government and how that impacts the business community. So how do you see uh, these elections influencing the economic situation of the country and what implications may there be for the sector? The question is to anybody of you, and in the meantime, I'm encouraging our audience to share more uh, of their thoughts and questions. Susan, I think that this is mostly for you. Oh, no, don't do this to me, Pavel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, being members of the Eurozone, I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, the economy is the factor that, that really holds the politics together and it really limits all, all kind of extravagances that we might expect. So I think in, in a way that the bad situation uh, has a, has a uh, good impact on, on the politics, which is, which, which is paradoxical, but, but it seems to, to be so. Uh, the, the inflation rate is, is dropping. I think the highest was in, in February and, and uh, it, it's dropping. The, uh, there is one more paradox that, that I would like to highlight Although uh, Viktor Orban's government and his style of governing is, is used as a bright example how, how to do it, how to oppose Brussels, how to do the, the really sovereign politics and, and uh, a sovereign uh, foreign policy. At the same time, it, we really don't have much of a discussion that, that economically Hungary is not doing well. And uh, I think the number one in, uh, in, in um, European countries in, in terms of inflation, that was Hungary. And uh, it is for me that, that is that is interesting that in in the battle with uh, Robert Fico, no one no one ever ha had an urge to mention it that uh, uh, Mr. Orban is an isolated figure in in terms of uh, his relations to um, Euro Atlantic partners to to his European partners, and uh, in terms of economy, um, Hungary is not doing well. Yeah, if if I may, I would add one aspect, uh, and it relates to regional development. I think that we have huge disparities in the country. Bratislava is luxurious place with a sort of similar to uh, any other Western place, uh, standard of living, cost of living very high and so on. Uh, but we have several regions which are very underprivileged uh, and uh, having all kinds of social economic problems and so on. And it resulted in great deal also in, in uh, if you look at the uh, map, that how urban versus rural population voted. So it will be big lesson for all politicians now to focus more on uh, uh, rural part of Slovakia and Christian Democrats uh, their chair is regional governor of Preshov region. Uh, and he, I think that he will be bringing uh, as opposition political party in the parliament, Christian Democrats uh, came back after eight years or so where they were out. Now they see new energy and basically what their strength is that they have the largest uh, network of mayors, deputies in village, municipal villages and so on. So I think that now, particularly with European funds, which Slovakia is notoriously known, not able to absorb them, this will be one of the topics how to not lose now time and resources which are offered to us by European Union to move ahead, uh, green issues, uh, how to move 
revitalization of uh, various regions of Slovakia and so on. So I think that it is being felt and being discussed. And there are also several other uh, former experts or mayors who are in the government, uh, who, who will be in the parliament or end up in government. So this topic of looking at regional disparities and boosting economy. And lastly, Poland, which is very often used as example that we were we are talking about building highway. It is symbol of our inability of sort of keeping promises. Every government since uh, three decades ago is finishing highway between two largest cities, Bratislava and Kosice, and we are still building it. And uh, in Poland, in the meantime, they developed whole network of highways. Croatia developed network of highways. So now the topic, how state will facilitate building these larger scale infrastructure type of project. I think that this is basically felt across political parties that they need to focus on this and, and help Slovakia, not only sort of uh, praising that we have per capita highest car producing, uh, that we are highest car producing country in the world, but at the same time, these disparities and, and also that car producing thing, it, it's, it, you know, it can change very quickly in, in case something happens with that. So I, I think economy will be very powerful and strong driver of political debate, both in new government, whatever composition it will have, but also across uh, uh, in the parliament. Mm -hmm. Just to, to... I might add, just just one one brief um, one brief thing to to Pavel's uh, discourse. Um, I think there is one more topic that that uh, needs to be addressed is it's the brain drain, and it's the caretaker the caretaker government of Mr. Odor that that really stressed this the uh, this idea, and I think that the that the government that comes in in power has to do something with it because this has been an issue uh, for quite a long time. It really uh, is uh, an issue that connects most of the post-socialist countries. So it's not the specialty of Slovakia, but it happens very easily in Slovakia because our neighboring countries, Czech Republic, uh, there is no language barrier and uh, uh, there are tens of thousands of uh, university students studying in Czech, Czech Republic. So I think that really gives uh, a, a, a very um, illustrative feedback to the educational system that we have. So that's another thing. And then we can also speak about the healthcare system that the pandemic uh, sort of gave a, a revision of, of uh, the situation and, and we definitely have to do something about it. Roman, please. So just to, thank you. Uh, so just to wrap this up with very, very quickly um, in terms of the political parties, right? The economy is to Smyrna's advantage, right? Smyrna has a very strong rhetorical appeal to most voters because their message is the state will take care of you. We will build a strong state. The state will take care of you, right? As Zuzana mentioned, right? All of these kind of emergency small hospitals that are closing down in your region, Smyrna won't close them. We'll build them up. Right. Um, and so this message of almost etatism, right, that we are for a strong state that will solve all of your economic issues resonated with um, voters, as Pavel was saying, particularly in Slovakia's poorer regions. Right. So Smyr definitely has a comparative advantage uh, relative to other parties um, on, on this issue, I think. Yeah. And just uh, on this brain drain, it was never such a huge issue and topic discussed because many particularly younger talented student age people are talking it's almost sort of uh, like general discussion and many of them were saying that if fits of would come we are leaving sort of uh, packing suitcases is something what is being discussed. So that is why this government formation process will be watched very much uh, by many young professional students. And we have the largest, if you look at university students, Slovak university students studying abroad versus studying at home at universities, we have the most unfavorable ratio 
in EU. So, and this issue of brain drain is something extremely important. But on the, at the same time, we never had such a high voters turnout from Slovaks living abroad, studying, working. There was 20, more than 20% increase in comparison with uh, 2020. Three, if you look at how many Slovak, Slovaks living, working, studying abroad voted three years ago versus now. So you have more than 20% increase. And also new Slovak diaspora in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and in other European Union countries got highly activated and cares about what's going on. And uh, I think that now recently, Zuzana Chaputova, our president, when she visited US in New York during EU, uh, I'm sorry, UN General Assembly, uh, she, together with Peter Pavel, president of Czech Republic, they had joined meeting there with uh, our diaspora, and there was a lot of enthusiasm and energy between those young professionals there, and they came from all parts of U.S. to New York to meet at Bohemian Hall at Manhattan with the two presidents. Uh, so I think that there is new dynamism not only of leaving, but also caring about Slovakia among those who live, study abroad. And I think that this is important factor which uh, caretaker government of Ludovic Odor immediately identified as key priority for his government. And they just recently released a rather extensive document how to deal with this uh, brain gain and brain drain and looking at conditions of young people not leaving, but caring about country and Ludovic Dodor and his cabinet. I think this will be part of legacy of these couple months serving uh, interim uh, caretaker government that they spotlighted this, made it very clear, uh, looked at it also through facts, figures, and are passing on to new cabinet that this topic is of strategic importance and we cannot just uh, overlook it if we want to be competitive country within family of EU. Thank you very much. Uh, we have roughly 10 minutes. So I turn towards uh, a cluster of questions we have received around the elephant in the room, uh, relations towards Russia, and uh, a potential uh, reorientation of uh, Slovak-Ukrainian uh, relations, Slovakia support towards Ukraine. So a bunch of questions I would like to uh, group together and ask our speakers to address are, first of all, um, SED adopted uh, uh, a more pro-Russian uh, rhetoric in this campaign. What do we know about the party's relations uh, with Russia? Uh, what is the substance there? Uh, second, I would like to ask you about the support for uh, Ukraine, namely, what is there still uh, to offer to Ukraine? Uh, what are the stocks that are still available uh, in Slovakia, uh, namely, whether um toning down support to Ukraine uh would really make a difference compared to the capabilities uh of, of uh what is still available in Slovakia. Um and to round out if you will uh what advice was also a question raised by one of our uh, audience members, what advice would you give to Ukraine how to advocate uh, for maintaining uh, support uh, for Ukraine, uh, depending on a new incoming government. Uh, and since we are relatively short on time, I would ask our speakers to limit themselves to roughly two minutes uh, each. Who would like to start? I will finish. I have a couple of points, yeah. I have just brief a uh, couple of points. Um, 
Slo- Slovakia has traditionally been an, uh, an arms, arms producer and there are arms being produced now for Ukraine. And I don't think that Robert Fico would want to miss on, on this opportunity. Uh, Peter Pellegrini already said that, that uh, Ukraine should count on it. And uh, Robert Fico said that uh, he already met the arms producers and, and arms dealers. So there is there is a high chance that that uh, this will continue. Uh, um, you, you you were asking about whether there is anything on the on the stocks. I don't think so. I think that uh, uh, why Mr. Fico was using no more uh, arms, no more bullets to to Ukraine. That was simply because there there is nothing else left that that can be sent. So so that, that's a a part of his pragmatism that he wasn't he wasn't really lying, but at the same time it can be interpreted as a as a radical sort of re- rhetorics. And uh, one one last point um, for Mr. Fitzo, it is quite easy to be pro pro Russian because a pro Ukrainian point of view has been missing from the debate. Uh, ever since uh, we were aware that we have three important neighbors, Slo- Slovakia, which is Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary, and uh, the shortest border is with uh, Ukraine, and uh, there is a Schengen border. And uh, really, there were very few contacts with with Ukraine. So this is this is uh, new for us. There, there, there is now a, a new Ukrainian diaspora. We have a new minority. There are very many Ukrainians living in in uh, Slovakia due to the war and I think their presence will will make a difference thank you very much Susanna. so uh agree completely right um and I think the major kind of international concern right and a potential cause of concern is that Robert Fico plays a role similar to Viktor Orban on the international stage right meaning in the EU within NATO that he's gonna you know obstruct right and he's gonna say well I need this right uh, before you know I will you know agree with the group's consensus decision right I not ruling out that possibility but I think that in any coalition that ends up forming, uh, HLAS will take the key kind of ministerial portfolios uh, responsible for foreign policy, right? And Petr Pellegrini, as was talked about here, has made his stance on foreign policy very, very clear, right? And in the end, Fico doesn't, okay, maybe this is too harsh of a way to say it. I was going to say he doesn't care about foreign policy, right? But I think that gets the message across. He cares about domestic politics. He wants the corruption proceedings to stop, right? He wants to reform the judiciary in his favor. He wants to put his people back into positions of power and continue on with his business like he has before, right? Foreign policy is a campaign issue to him. Um, So I, I don't see major risk, though I'm not ignoring all potential risk is how I would phrase that. And I want to stress uh, Zuzana's last point here about the Ukrainian community within Slovakia, right? Major new societal dynamic across Central and Eastern Europe, right? In the Czech Republic, even more so, right? In Poland, even more so than Slovakia, right? Um, And for a long time, Slovakia has been unable and unwilling, right, to put together an administrative and bureaucratic apparatus that effectively integrates uh, third country nationals, right? Like people from Ukraine, non-EU citizens. Um, and so this is an opportunity for Slovakia, right? To kind of get, you know, its its bureaucracy, its laws uh, and its capacity for effective integration together, right? Because there are worker shortages, right? A, across the board from the factories to the medical professionals, right? So this is a major opportunity for Slovakia to take advantage of this new workforce, right? Um, whether Fico's government with HLAS and uh, SNS in partnership will be willing to take advantage of this opportunity is another question. And there I'm, I'm not so so optimistic. Thank you very much, Roman. Hey, uh... Both my uh, friends articulated it very clearly, and I do not disagree. On the contrary, I agree with uh, what they said. And let me add a few things uh, since we are concluding this session. I think that in last one and a half years, Slovakia did vis-a-vis Ukraine great job. I mean, uh, helping that country in all fronts in humanitarian terms just remind you that last year shortly after outbreak of war jill biden first lady came 
visited Slovak Ukrainian borders on Mother's Day, crossed the border, met with First Lady of Ukraine. It just showed that how intertwined our countries are, and uh, then helping militarily, politically, and so on. So I think that uh, we shouldn't let spoil our attitudes, both of people, government, and business, churches, self-governing units, with uh, Robert Fico's pre-election accusation and uh, and all kinds of conspiracy things, what he was doing. Uh, so I think that uh, for Slovakia, success of Ukraine is of strategic importance because having Russia on our borders would be a nightmare. And Globsec just recently released this paper of uh, on consequences of uh, win Ukraine victory or Ukraine uh, defeat. So for us, particularly for neighbors, but for all European security architecture, I think it's quite clear that we need to continue helping our Eastern neighbor to win uh, in this and not let uh, speculate on this. And uh, on lighter note, I think that if Robert, because you asked Zhuzha also that what probably we can expect and how we could talk to them or how Ukrainians should talk to uh, Robert Fico in whatever uh, position he will be. I think that uh, I would uh, create, and now this will be semi-ironical, I would make him leader of uh, peace task force because he wants to create peace. I Within EU, we are missing task force for peace. We sent a Slovak personality, Katarina Maternova, was sent as EU ambassador to Kiev. Uh, and Miroslav Lachowski was very unambiguously saying that Slovakia, during historical meeting of EU foreign ministers in Kiev with uh, Josep Borrell, who met together with Zelensky and cabinet, that Slovakia is continuing assisting. So we have commitment even on caretaker government now, which are passing button to new cabinet, Katarina Maternova representing EU in Kiev. We are missing task force on peace and let's Robert Fico to show us how to achieve that peace. So this would be one. And second, I think that we in Slovakia have a huge choir and ballet group from Kharkiv second largest city of Ukraine when it was attacked. A whole theater which was uh, shelled was moved to uh, southern Slovakia to Gabčíkovo. They live there, a couple hundred Ukrainian artists and do enormous performances across the country and also in other places. So whoever will be in government, I think that Kharkiv orchestra and ballet should do special performance and invite whole new cabinet to see <laughs> what kind of cultural treasure we have and help that choir and ballet to go back home as soon as possible. They should create another task force, uh, which would just help those who are with us and wish them well and help as much as we can to finish this bloody conflict which is ruining not only our region, but ruining whole international order. And I just strongly believe that Slovakia will not be outlier, that we will just abandon uh, uh, or do things which uh, will be even close to some of these rhetorical exercises, what we heard uh, before these uh, parliamentary elections. Thank you very much, Poavo, for these uh, encouraging words. Indeed, let's hope for that. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, the three of you for sharing your insights and knowledge with us. I think uh, you gave really uh, an in-depth overview that helps us to understand what really is going on in Slovakia and what we should be watching out for in the coming weeks. I would also like to thank our audience for uh, staying with us today. Uh, we had um, participants joining us from both sides of the Atlantic, which I'm very happy about. Uh, please keep up this good habit. Uh, we will do our best to deliver uh, informative and interesting discussions to you on political developments uh, around Europe. 
I would like to encourage you to follow our channels, both GMF, GMF Engaging Central Europe, as well as Authlib, uh, as we will continue our conversations around these topics. Uh, please stay tuned for our next events. We will, of course, cover the Polish elections as well. We have a very busy period in Central Europe, but also uh, stay tuned beyond as we will have uh, also some more uh, academic discussions discussions also coming up in the future. Uh, so hopefully everybody will find something of interest. Thank you very much once again uh, to all of you and stay with us for future events. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Bye-bye.